Okay, my name is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is 25 September 2021, and I'm conducting an interview with Will Swenson. We're at the 2021 Tank Farm Open House. Uh, Will, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? That kind of thing. So I'm from Seattle, Washington. Uh, up there in the Pacific Northwest, we like to brag about our rain, our beer, and Microsoft and Amazon and Starbucks and all the other gifts that we've given you. Uh, it's a great little part of the country. Recommend a visit. And uh, what branch of the service were you in? So, Army. Army. Yeah, any other family members that, were, that served? I was actually the first of my entire family to be really? in the military. Uh, we had one brief iteration of a family member in World War II who was in the military, but it was a direct commission. It was because they had logistical experience. So really, I am the first. Right. Why uh, Why did you decide to serve and why the Army? You know, for my generation, 9-11 was a transformative experience. Uh, for those of us who were graduating college at that time, uh, we looked at the world change and everything that we thought that we were going to be doing, we realized we had to reevaluate how it was going to go. Right. So for me, leaving university, I thought I was going to be part of government service, but I thought I was going to be in a very different location, very doing very different things. That right. steeled me into a certain direction. Okay. And why the Army? Well, the Army actually offered a pretty good uh, opportunity for me. I had, I had seen the Army in operation in, in the Balkans. I'd seen the, uh, the military actually out there doing things on the ground level. That, that I was impressed by. But I, I, I held on to that story and I never really thought much of else beyond uh, what I'd seen. And then of course 9-11, it, it shook my memory and it, it made me recall that there was one organization truly doing something in the Balkans and that was the US military and especially the US Army. And so I reached out and I, I said, hey, so uh, well, let's talk a little bit. Let's see if my skill set matches up with what you need right now. And it did. And I went through officer candidate school and shortly thereafter I found myself in a position of authority and uh, fighting, fighting the global war on terror. Right. Let's go rewind briefly, 9-11, where were you? So 9-11, I was at a home, and I was graduating from university at that time, and I had actually turned on the TV, and uh, good old rabbit ears, early TV, and I don't even remember why I did that. And there it was on the uh, local news watching it in real time. And it became very quick, clear very quickly that this was not a normal day. This was not an accident. And uh, once I understood the gravity of the situation after all four planes went down, it became clear again that the world had changed. Right. So that day, as, as you're watching it, um, the impact of it and what it would mean for the next 20 years, that, that was something you recognized right then? The gravity of the moment when you see four airplanes go down, two of which went into the, the towers, one of which went into the Pen uh, Pentagon and one went down in Pennsylvania. You look at a situation like that and you realize that this is a coordinated attack on a scale that we have not seen before. And that means that we have an, we have an adversary out there that is something that we are not quite capable of addressing with what we have been doing in the past. And of course, we had already had the USS Cole. We had already had several events that had led us to understand almost immediately who the perpetrators of this, this act were. Uh, so with that, it didn't take a lot of understanding to get to the final conclusion, which was, we are now a nation at war. We are going to deploy and we are going to track down those who attacked us. What did you do in the army? Uh, so I, I was an infantry officer when I, when I first joined the military, and uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege to lead a platoon in Afghanistan for my first tour, and then I switched over to advisory missions in Iraq and Afghanistan after that. Tell us about that first tour, your folks and moments in combat. What is that like? You know, Afghanistan at that time was a very unique place. It was still... Uh, it was still very remote. It had not yet joined the 21st century or 20th century at that point. It was cut off. And the people were, uh, as an experience, Afghanistan isn't raw combat. It's, it's, it's not a place that you find an easy enemy. You don't really know who the adversary is. And even if you understand who the adversary is, you can almost understand their point of view. It was a complicated place to work. And uh, again, having the privilege to have a platoon, you have a incredible asset that the US government has given you to employ against an enemy. But we understood that there was more complexity to it than just having raw military power. It's what else we did. We had to be ambassadors of the United States. We had to be diplomats. We had to be aid workers. We had to be uh, someone who was on the ground articulating the US foreign policy to a group of people who had not quite understood that we were not Russians at that point. It was, to some degree, hokey to say, but there are a lot of communities that did not realize that we were Americans, not Russians. 
it was still early enough in the war that they had not quite gotten the memo. Right. And you, I'm sure, have studied what went on in, in Afghanistan in the 80s. How did that direct how you approach these people, knowing that what the Russians had done and how long they'd been there and been unsuccessful in their mission? Uh, even though the missions are different, our mission and their mission totally came from different places. But does that does that guide how you approach? Well, sure. I mean, uh, again, so there's a concept of the strategic corporal. And the, strate the strategic corporal is somebody who, at a very junior level, has the ability to influence U.S. foreign policy on a, on a much greater scale than what their rank would usually dictate. In previous wars, it was generals who ran the wars. When you find yourself in a situation like Afghanistan, you start finding yourself being the lone representative of the United States government as a lieutenant. And so you rapidly realize that you were a strategic lieutenant and you had to lean not only on your tactical knowledge, not only on the strategic assets that you were actually given to achieve your mission set, but also the cultural parameters, the historical parameters, and understanding simply who these people were. Right. To not know Afghanistan's history was to ensure failure. Right. You said that some of the people there didn't even know that you were Americans. Um, so I would make the assumption they had no idea why you were even there. 9-11 is probably, what do you, you know, you've never heard of it. So how do you how do you approach the people and, and say this is why we're here? You know, something happened in our country and it, you know it originated from your country. Were they receptive to that? Did they say could they have any kind of empathy, you know, for that? Or you know, for the most part, the urban areas of Afghanistan or the periphery of the urban areas, they, they they knew what was happening. They had a very good understanding of what had happened and they understood quite well why we were there. Uh, it's, it's when you started having to go out into the hinterlands, those areas that truly had separated themselves even from mainstream Afghan culture, which at that time was separated from mainstream global culture. So you find yourself out in these hinterlands and these are people who had just simply been trying to avoid the conflict of the last 30 previous years. Right. And with that, they did have a misunderstanding of who we were. They had not had the opportunity to figure out who the American people were, why we were there, what our messaging was. but. It did not take long for them to understand. We as a country far, far away had been attacked. We are here to find those people who had attacked us. And ultimately Afghans, they understand power. And they were respectful of that, so long as we were respectful of them. Did you have any, what were your thoughts, your personal thoughts about whether or not why we would be able to achieve the mission given what's, given Afghan, Afghanistan's history? So, we speak of Afghanistan as it's the graveyard of empires, and it's simply not. Afghanistan is not the graveyard of empires. Afghanistan is a singularly difficult, complicated mission set if you want to go in militarily. The reason it was the graveyard of some empires was more to do with those empires' overreach that came well before even being in Afghanistan. We as Americans, we went into Afghanistan with a different set of uh, 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 morals, a different set of objectives, and certainly a different economic base. We had tangible, achievable goals in Afghanistan initially, which was counterterrorism. We find the people who did this, we find anyone who's assisting them, and we crush them. And we did that. And then we did what Americans do. We look around and we say, we can make this better. We want to help. And we did. For many Afghanistan, for many of the people in Afghanistan, we helped their lives. We, we, we singularly changed what that country was. And for better or for worse, even though they were not there today, we did things for that country that will benefit them as we go into the 21st century, because we brought them into the 21st century. If you look at what's happening there right now, the previous organization that allowed in Al-Qaeda has realized that they cannot be the organization they were before. They understand that there's global scrutiny. They understand that they have to be a different entity altogether if they wish to manage a country. It's one thing to be an insurgent group. It's one thing to wait us out. It's a whole nother to run a country. And the people of Afghanistan and the world are now watching to see what they do next. You said you were in Iraq as well. How did those two places differ? Iraq was a very different fight. Um, it was a much more difficult fight. You're talking about a group of people who have been connected to the global world. They did have access to media. They traveled. They were Many of them were educated in the United States. They knew who we were. We had worked with them as partners. It was a very complicated place to be. 
there was a degree of ambiguity that we had, both uh, uh, tactically as well as morally, that made the mission set much more much more difficult to accomplish. Um, you were awarded the Medal of Honor. Can you tell us about that? You know, so one of the things about the Medal of Honor, and, and, and you use the correct term, you're, you're awarded it, you never win it. And it's not something you seek. It's not something that you look for, and it's not something you ever expect to have happen to you. It's a lightning strike. But when you start to realize and recognize what this award represents, you start understanding the gravity of the situation. I felt on the day that I received that award, well, the, the event that I was in that, that ultimately resulted in me receiving this award, I looked around the battlefield and I saw a bunch of people doing the exact same thing that I had done. I saw a gr group of people who'd come together collectively across all the branches of the military. At that time, we had Air Force, we had Marines, we had Army, we had Navy, all working together with our Afghan partners collectively to achieve a singular goal. And the day went south, things went bad, but we all came together. And out of that battle, the military tries to recognize excellence. They try to recognize uh, individuals who've done things that, that stand out. But ultimately, what's different about this award specifically is that it doesn't really represent the individual. It's simply they had to find an individual to attribute what had happened on that battlefield and all the valor that was seen on that ba battlefield. They had to attribute it to one person because that person has to carry the message. Now, oftentimes this is a posthumous award, so that story becomes static. For the living recipients, we understand that we have a new re responsibility, and that responsibility is to tell the story of everything that we saw that day, to tell Americans, to tell the world about a group of people who came together collectively to fight singularly for a single objective and would leave no man behind and would do anything for their person next to them. It, it's, it's, it's unique. It's unique. But it's never attributed to the individual. One person has to carry the award. It's a heavy weight but it belongs to everyone who is there. And ultimately, the only thing that it takes to actually receive the Medal of Honor is raising your right hand and swearing allegiance to this country and your allegiance to serve in the military. That's it. There is nothing different about that young soldier who deploys over to Iraq and has the valor to step into a Humvee, drive down the road, and their journey ends when an IED hits them. That's just the unfair nature of war. That's the ugliness of war. Statist statistical improbability or probability of, of incapacitation. Would that soldier have re risen to the level of receiving the Medal of Honor had they been given the opportunity? Absolutely. But they didn't receive that opportunity. Their journey ended at a singular event. I know that if I was one step to the left, it wouldn't be my award, or I wouldn't be telling the story in person. That is the difference between this award and all the other awards. Share a little bit about that day? That day specifically, and this is part of my privilege, is to tell the story about a group of people who came together. I was working on an advisory mission. Uh, I worked with the Afghan Border Patrol, which is effectively a paramilitary organization. And we were combining um, our operations with as many Afghan uh, government forces as we could. So I worked closely with the US Marine Corps, who was advising the Afghan National Army, as well as the Afghan National Police. And uh, we had been working with the local governor and a group of uh, a disparate group of other Afghan governmental organizations. What we were trying to do is show that the Afghan government was capable of projecting not just power, but leadership and governance into rest of areas and do so respectfully. And also we were trying to show the American people that this could be done with the proper ratios, that this is an Afghan led Afghan fought battle. And we'd had a number of successes. This was uh, the battle that I got involved in for this award was one of uh, a, a sequence of events that had been happening previous to this over, the, over a buildup of several months. Uh, it was part of a larger strategy. And on this day specifically, the Afghan National Army was in the lead and they were with their Marine advisors and I was with my Afghan Border Patrol and uh, we were in a supporting role. And due to geopolitics and <laughs> how things were working in Pakistan, we found ourselves battling not the usual cast of characters. We, we found ourselves dealing with a much different group of people. Uh, so everything that I'd learned over a year of already being there was thrown out the window. We were dealing with a new set of people. Uh, and uh, it, that day, due to not just the threat of the enemy, but as well as some decisions that we had made as a country as to how we were going to employ our forces in battle meant that we found ourselves on a battlefield 
in a very fair fight, which is not something that we like to do in the US military. We don't fight fair. We fight with overwhelming superiority. We fight to win. We fight with a decisive objective. And on that day, we got bogged down fair, fighting fair. And that meant that the enemy had a vote. And the enemy voted. We lost five US service members and 10 Afghans. So on that day, the bravery that I saw was beyond anything that I could have imagined we could have done. I saw the Marine Corps refuse to leave behind three Marines and one Navy corpsman. We made sure that we had my partner, uh, Sergeant First Class Westbrook, walk off the battlefield. He later succumbed to his injuries, but he made it back to the, to the States. And we made sure that the families of Johnson, Johnson, Kennefick, and Layton had the opportunity to meet and see their loved ones, their fathers, their sons, their husbands come back to the United States and be given the proper respect. Some people would, they read your citation and they wonder why would you put yourself out there like that? What makes you, why would you do that for, for someone else? Um, put your life on the line in a foreign land. Um, what, what, does that go through your mind at all or you just have a job to do when you do it and the chips fall where they may? You know, ultimately we're a professional fighting force. Right. We train to fight. We train as we fight. In fact, we make the training more unpleasant than the fighting oftentimes. So part of it is professionalization. You just simply do your job. But that throws out the human component. You as an individual, you feel an allegiance to those people who would be just as loyal to you as you will be to them. And you will not let them down. And that transcends even country. I had Afghan partners there who stood side by side, side by side with me. They were willing to fight and die. And we stood side by side with them. And of course, our Marines, and our sailor, and our soldier that day, we stood side by side. I have two more questions for you. How, do you. how would your military experience, now that you have time to look back on it and reflect, how's that shaped who you are today? It's the most formative component of my life. Uh, everything that came before it and everything that will come after will always be through the lens of what I did in the service. And lastly, the reason we do these interviews is we want to capture and preserve your story because it matters. Your experiences are unique to you. And we want to take those stories and hopefully in 50 or 100 years, some young boy or girl is watching this. What message do you want to send them? We as, as Americans, we're a unique concept. We're an idea. We don't have a tangible physical identity. It's always shifting. It's always changing. It's up to us to decide what that is. We have geographic borders, they're lines on a map, and that what is inside those lines does define us to some degree. But we are an idea. And that is an idea that has been defended from generations before me and the generations that will come after me to preserve this idea. And around the world, the idea of American exceptionalism comes from the fact that we can be an idea that everyone wants to be a part of. Well, certainly I thank you, sir, for your service. And I thank you for sitting down and taking a few minutes out of your day to, to tell your story. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. And I think it's extremely important for people to hear, hear your words and uh, to hear that message. So thank Indeed. You.